Our hope is for you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. After the service, begin that process by connecting with a leader and joining one of our many small groups or teams. But for now, sit back and enjoy this message. Make some noise, everybody. You made it to church. What is up, Substance? If we haven't met yet, I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and I'm, I'm just so blessed you guys are here today. I, we're gonna have some fun. Like we always do at Substance, we just like to keep things lighthearted and exciting, because I, I, I ultimately believe that the, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and if you don't have joy today, then we're gonna, we're gonna get you there by the end of the service. And of course, before we dive into the message, I, I wanna share a little bit of a backstory. Many of you guys know that uh, my wife and I have always been very passionate about uh, missions, uh, just sharing Christ overseas and helping build God's church over in places where, uh, in, in countries that might be a little hostile. In fact, actually, uh, my, my wife and I never even imagined that we would actually stay in the United States. We always imagined uh, that we were gonna be moving overseas somewhere. And, and I, 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 even gearing up for that, I remember even uh, a long time ago, my wife and I would, would take different countries and we'd spend a summer in each country just trying to get a, a sense of what God was doing around the world. And uh, from I, I spent a summer in Thailand, I spent a summer in Ghana, West Africa, and I, I'll never forget when I was in, in West Africa, uh, you know, we'd be out sharing Christ in some of these really remote villages. And, and some of these villages were so remote, it was a very, very hostile place if you had any sort of medical issue because there's no hospitals anywhere. I mean, you're talking about, you know, a four-hour bumpy ride on a, on a terrible, un finished gravel road uh, just to get basic needs. And so you'd meet all these, these people in some of these villages that had the smallest things that we would totally take care of here in the States would be lethal over there. I mean, people would die from the, the silliest things in, in, in a lot of these villages. And, and, and sure enough, we were sharing Christ in, in one of these villages. And so like over there, like the, the whole idea of Christ as the healer was just was, was way more profound than here in the United States where always we trust doctors to heal. We don't really, you know what I'm saying? It's not quite as desperate as it is over there. And of course, uh, right after we had just shared Christ in this one village, uh, a woman came up. She, was, she actually was blind. She couldn't find us, but her sister led her up to us. And this, this, this girl said, I really believe that your God can heal me. Would you pray for me that he would heal me right here? And I, I remember in that moment, okay, I was kind of a younger believer and I'd never really seen an undeniable miracle. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I had prayed for people, you know, like, you know, your friend, he's got a cold and you pray for him and then five days later they're healed. <laughs> I had seen those kinds of miracles where you're like, oh, okay, the miracle was you got through a cold. You know what I'm saying? But like, I, I just, I'd never actually seen an undeniable miracle. And when this lady came up to me, to be honest, I was terrified. I don't know what, how else to describe it. I was all of a sudden terrified, like, oh no, like, this is a real person with a real need who is new to this whole thing. What if I pray for her and God doesn't heal her? You know what I'm saying? Like, this thought, like, it terrified me. Like, what, what would, ha like, 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 could it wreck God's reputation that we're even talking about healing. And in my head, I'm like, well, Jesus healed people. And yet, you know, it, like, and, and again, I'm a chronic overthinker. I don't know if anybody else has, is an overthinker, but this is just like in that moment, I was so terrified. And, and I, the girl who I was with, she was just a, you know, young woman of faith. She's like, let's do it, man. Let's, let's pray for healing. And I'm like, oh, should we be doing this? You know, like, and so we're praying for this la lady and sure enough, God healed her on the spot. She started shrieking, freaking out. She got her sight back. I'd never seen a biblical miracle like this. I was more terrified than she was, okay? <laughs> I was more surprised than she was, and yet I was supposed to be the guy sharing the gospel. And I, I remember like, you know, like after that happened, all of a sudden, like my faith got all pumped up and it was like, yeah! Let's pray for people. Let's pray. You know, like then I was all pumped. Like, I'm never going to doubt God again. And, and then, and you know what's funny about faith is it's like leaky fuel. It's not something you get once and then, you know, you just filled your car up with gas and you can just drive forever. You know what I'm saying? You, you, faith is like, it, it eventually leaks out. And, and, and sure enough, over a year or two later, worry started creeping in, doubt started creeping in. And I started thinking, 
I started getting afraid to pray for people again. What if they don't get healed? What happened? Because I hadn't worked through things theologically. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this story is because I actually believe that these types of tensions are going to be a natural byproduct for all of us when we're engaging in supernatural Christianity. All of us are going to experience a tension. In theology, they call it the already but not yet. In other words, in heaven, we're gonna have the fullness of the kingdom. Right now, we're just getting little deposits, okay? So it, it feels like it's kind of off and on, like why God heals this person but not that person. And, and you see this even in the Gospels, like the Apostle Paul who raised people from the dead, he also said, I, Tromphemus, I left sick in Miletus. You know, so even the Apostle Paul experienced unanswered prayer. Uh, you know, so you see this, and yet there's this tension, like why doesn't it always work, right? There's, a, there's not just a tension, but a burden that you and I have to carry, if you will, that we're going to have to become accustomed to if we want to engage God in supernatural Christianity. And so just to illustrate the Bible text that we're about to go into, I, I need my two volunteers on stage that I, I pulled out earlier. Okay, we got our volunteers. Now, I, a few years back, I... Give it up for our volunteers today. It takes a lot of guts to stand on the stage. Come on, we got, we got Macy and Josue here. Okay, and I'm gonna introduce them in a second, but I, I, this, uh, my pastor friend, Andrew Garden in Lakeland, Florida, showed me this metaphor a, a while back, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's the perfect Bible object lesson to set this up. And of course, right here, we got Josue playing bass guitar for us. Come on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it when you play bass, and maybe it's just the way you've got this awesome hair that just kind of, it's like broody. It's awesome. I just, mm. And then, of course, we got Macy, who also leads worship here at our Northtown campus. Okay, now, uh, Jose and Macy, this is what we're going to do is I, I'm going to have you guys illustrate something, but we're going to do like a little relay race if you will. You guys are gonna, it's a competition, uh, we're ladies against men, and so what we're gonna do is in this, and so to do this, you guys are gonna race from this stairwell to that stairwell, and then you're gonna go back and forth three times, and whoever wins gets substance merch. Okay, okay, so now, but as you do this, though, um, I am gonna have you each carry something different, okay, so uh, this, Macy is going to get my lucky pen. Everybody see my lucky pen? Um, she has to run with my lucky pen. And so, Macy, I bequeath this to you. Just don't mess with it, okay? And if it explodes, it's not my fault. Okay, so then, and then, uh, uh, Josue, you are going to carry these handcuffs. Now, some of you are like, what are you doing with handcuffs? Well, you're going to find out in a second. I, I, I needed handcuffs today. These are actually Pastor Nate's handcuffs. I don't know why he had them, but uh, he did, but um, no, actually, so I literally had to, I'm like, Carolyn, can you ask the staff if they have handcuffs? And then everybody was like, why does Pastor Peter need handcuffs? <laughs> it's for his sermon, okay? Uh, no, and surprisingly, all of them had them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, they didn't. We had to buy these for this, but I, okay. So Josue, this is what we're gonna do, is I'm gonna put these on your, I'm gonna put, like, you got kind of big risk. I'm gonna do this because you're kind of a bigger guy, and to make this fair, I want to make this fair. So now these handcuffs, what we're going to do is I want just lean over here. Yeah, okay, there we go. Then I am going to handcuff you to this fancy schmancy uh, industrial uh, stepladder, okay? So now it rolls, so you can still pull this. You can, yeah, so it's going to slow you down just a little bit. I might stand on it when you do this. But uh, okay, but but you're gonna race. Does this make sense? You guys are gonna race back and forth on the, on uh, as soon as I say go. And 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 now this is what we're gonna do though. Is I, I just quickly before they race, I want to quickly survey the audience and find out who do you think is gonna win. Is it gonna be Josue? Some of you are like, no, I believe in you, Josue. You got this. Okay, how many of you think it's gonna be Macy? Very confident there, very confident. Okay, so now, okay, now for the sake of safety, we are not gonna do this, and so you guys can actually go sit down. Thank you so much. Give it up for our volunteers. Okay. Oh, you need the keys. I don't have the keys, actually. I'm, does anybody have the keys? Uh, 
I totally forgot the keys. Yeah, that, we'll, we'll take care of you later. You just, you just hang out there. Actually, we do. Give it up for our volunteers, everybody. You're great, Josue. Thank you so much. Don't lose Pastor Nate's handcuffs. Oh, okay, good. Somebody has the keys. All right, okay, good. See, it all worked out in the end. Okay, now, for the sake of safety, I didn't want to actually do the race. That was just a, it was a setup because I wanted you guys to visualize something that is very important. In fact, actually, could I get that, my lucky pen and the handcuffs back? Could I have somebody bring those back up to me? Now, I, I, I did that object lesson because I wanna point out two different approaches to Christianity that are symbolized by those two things, the lucky pen and the handcuffs, okay? So in a second, oh, they ran off with them, unbelievable. <laughs> so somebody, uh, all right, all right, we'll get them, we'll get them. Thank you, thank you, Artem. Okay, now these two things represent two different approaches to Christianity, okay? Now, the pen, it's fairly light. I, you can carry this around fairly easily. These are actually heavy all by themselves, even when you're not changed to an industrial stepladder. But, but these two things represent two approaches to Christianity, two different types of burdens, and you're gonna wanna write these down, okay? This pen represents the burden of obedience, the burden of obedience of obedience. Whenever you read a command in God's word, a command necessitates obedience. It's a request to do something. And so this pen represents the burden of obedience. It's not a very heavy burden. It's fairly light, okay? Now, th this, these handcuffs and the ladder that, that Josue was, was, was cuffed to represents the burden of outcome, the burden of obedience, versus the burden of outcome. Now, how are they different, the burden of obedience? Let's say you're reading God's word and you come upon a command, Mark 16, 17 talks about Christians praying for the sick, okay? So it's a command to go pray for the sick. Now, God's word challenges us with a command. That means it necessitates the first burden, the burden of obedience, okay? If people need healing, the Bible tells us, place our hands on them and, and pray for the sick so that they may be well. It's actually gonna be one of the signs of, of a Christian is that when we pray for people, there's miracles that happen, okay? The burden of obedience, and so that's what we do. We obey, right? Now, some people, though, some Christians, they'll pick up more than just one burden. The burden of obedience, they'll pick that up, right? But then what they do is, in addition, they pick up the burden of outcome. In other words, what is the burden of outcome? It, well, it's the result, okay? So in, in, the, in the case of praying for the sick, it would be healing. The burden of outcome is healing. And so if you're praying for someone and you're worried, what if they don't get healed? Then it is a sign that you are carrying both burdens, the burden of obedience to pray for the sick, and you're worried about the outcome, the burden of the outcome. Worry is one of the preeminent signs that you are carrying the burden of outcome. Now, I, I share that. Actually, there's a lot of side effects to the burden of outcome when you carry it. The fruit of the Holy Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, so uh, nine fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Whenever you're lacking the fruit of the Spirit, it's usually a sign that you are carrying burdens God never called you to carry, particularly the burden of outcome. Now, I'm distinguishing these two burdens because God never called us to carry the burden of outcome. And let me, let me just show you this. Okay, so Jesus was explaining to people. People were coming up to him and saying, what kind of rabbi are you? Are you a strict rabbi or are you a chill rabbi? And so Jesus goes to explain what's called a rabbi's yoke. And if you don't know what a rabbi's yoke, you, many of you guys might know like the ancient, like you'd yoke oxen and then you'd have the plow and it was like how you did farming, right? Well, okay, th there was also something called a rabbi's yoke. When you take the yoke of a rabbi, when you'd follow a particular rabbi, all of them had a, a list of teachings that they would agree with, like a list of do's and don'ts, for lack of a better expression. So a rabbi's yoke is a list of do's and don'ts. What, are you a strict rabbi? It means you have a heavy yoke. Or are you a chill rabbi? You have a light yoke. And Jesus is, is explaining the way he approaches the Father, and he says this. You wanna know who I am? You wanna know what it is to follow me? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm the kind of rabbi, when you follow, you feel rest. You feel peace. You feel chill, okay? Take my yoke upon you, the, my approach to the Father, and you will and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you wanna know how my approach to God is, you're gonna feel lighter at the end of the day. You're gonna feel rest-filled. You're gonna feel gen- gentleness, humility. You're gonna, it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a light thing. It's gonna actually be good for you. It's good for weary people. You want, my approach to the Father is, is great for anyone who is feeling weary, okay? So Jesus is basically saying, hey, if you follow me, it, it's gonna be easier. You're gonna, it's gonna feel lighter instead of heavier. But listen, if you carry the wrong burdens, it's not gonna be that way, okay? So now I, I point this out because, again, burden of obedience is what God calls us to. Burden of outcome over time, it's gonna kill you. And I point this out because some of you have a form of Christianity where you have chained yourself, you've cuffed yourself to the outcomes of you being a better person, you earning your way into heaven. You, when you pray for healing, the, the people get it or you won't even bother, right? It, it's, the, it's the outcome, okay? If I don't, it won't. If I don't, it won't. It's a natural striving approach to Christianity. And so if you take the burden of outcome when it comes to healing, again, God never called us to heal people. He called us to pray for people to be healed. Okay, do you see the difference? Burden of obedience, burden of outcome. The same thing proves true when it comes to evangelism here as well, okay? So it's the same thing like when it comes to sharing Christ, okay? For, for example, many of you guys know we do our, our Christmas, well, everything we do here is actually to make it easier for you to share Christ with your friends. I always tell people, you're never gonna understand why we do what we do here at Substance unless you regularly invite your unchurched neighbor because this is not a country club for Christian consumers. At Substance, This isn't about long-term Christians. This is about people who don't come here and making it easier for you to invite those people. And so uh, we we do things like our Christmas services with with your unchurched friends in mind. We always film the sitcom. And of course, uh, there was this one church member who was like, he wanted to invite his friend, but he was so worried about it because he's like, oh, I don't think this friend is like really like super open to God. They don't act like a, you know, they certainly don't act like a Christian. Their language certainly doesn't sound like a Christian. And uh, I'm so worried. Like, oh, like, what, what if they don't come? What if, and they were, they were chronically overthinking it, and I could see from a mile away, they were just all up in their head, you know what I'm saying, about whether or not to invite their friend. And, and I, I finally went to this guy, and I'm like, you are taking way too much responsibility for this. Your job is so simple. Take this tiny little invite card and give it to them. That's it, okay? Your job is just to invite Your job is not to guarantee they show up, nor is your job to guarantee they accept Christ. Do you understand? That's the burden of outcome. Your job is the burden of obedience. Keep it simple. And and then finally he was like, oh, okay. He actually invited his his friend and his friend came to church and loved it. He's like, oh my gosh, now I have to sit with them every week. No, he wasn't like that. But you know how it is. He, it was just like, it was like, wow. Like, it, it was actually, it was a profound moment for him because he realized he was carrying the wrong burden. All he had to do is carry the burden of obedience, not the burden of outcome. So it works the same with healing as it does with evangelism, as it does with a lot of things. I, as another example, my friend Rob Hoskins oversees a missions organization and, and they have missionaries all over the world. And he was telling me the story of a missionary in Laos uh, it's basically over by Vietnam, Thailand. It's a, uh, Asia Pacific. And, and uh, the missionary had been living there for quite a way, but he, the missionary just had this one particular tribe on his heart. And this tribe was a remote tribe, way up in the mountains, very hard to access, uh, to get access to, even in Laos, okay? I mean, it was like a three-day uh, horseback ride up into the mountains, okay? So not easy to access these tribes that lived up there. And, and of course, the circumstances always conspired against this missionary from from getting up there to share Christ with this tribe. Well, all of a sudden, to make matters worse, war started breaking out between France and some Laotian insurgents. And so, um, you know, all the Westerners were basically being required by the State Department to leave the country, things like that. And of course, the missionary was one of those high-risk people that had to leave. And, and it was just, it, it was really frustrating for the missionary because they, he didn't have enough time to get up there and share with this tribe. Well, right as he was packing and he was getting ready to leave, he all of a sudden happened to run into some people on his very street that happened to be visiting from that tribe that he always wanted to share Christ with. And he's like, oh my gosh, you're from that tribe? Would you guys... 
I would be honored if you would have dinner with me tonight. Could you, would you guys be my guests at, at dinner tonight? He had them over for dinner, the, these people from this tribe. And of course, the missionary was like, oh my gosh, like, um, I, I wanna just share something with you and shared Christ with them and, and, and had, a, had a Bible that he wanted to give them. But the problem was the Bible was in French and these, these guys didn't really speak French. They didn't really, they knew just a tiny little bit of French. And, and so he, in, in his mind, he's like, should I even bother to give them this French Bible? in a language they don't even speak because, and, and then he asked them, hey, do any of you speak French? And they're like, no, does anybody in your village speak French? Uh, well, there's one guy, uh, the village witch doctor speaks French. And he's thinking, oh, okay. Um, you know, he's thinking, is it even worth it to give them this Bible? Is this like a useless gift? And then the missionary finally thought, well, hey, Anything is better than nothing. Some God's word is better than no God's word, even if it's in a language they don't have. And you know, it's not like the witch doctor is gonna help translate the Bible, right? But uh, uh, I'm leaving the country and I may never come back. And so he, he just, I just wanted to give you a gift. He gave them this Bible. They were really honored by the gift. And, 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 and then sure enough, war broke out. The missionary had to leave the country. And year after year after year, the missionary thought about that lost tribe. Couldn't get it out of his heart. Always wanted to get back to Laos. But, you know, this war just went on for a good seven long years. Well, finally, there was like a truce that was struck uh, between France and the insurgents and the missionary was like, yes, I get to go back to Laos and, 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 and this time I'm not going to miss going to that tribe. I'm gonna get to that tribe. I'm gonna share the gospel to that tribe. And remember, it was remote. It was another three days, even in Laos, by horseback to get to these tribes. And, and guess who he ran into seven years later, the very group he had over for dinner. And guess what they did with their French Bible? They gave it to the witch doctor. And guess who got saved became a pastor and started preaching to the tribes, the witch doctor. And get this, just hold on, hold, get this. By the end of the war, there were over 748 Christians who were led to Christ by that witch doctor who in turn went and preached the gospel in 11 different tribes. Talk about a revival because of a silly little act. <laughs> giving someone a Bible. Now, I, I just... I share that because it just demonstrates the power of the outcome versus the power of obedience. Just learning how to, the little things. I think you and I, we sweat over the outcome and we don't do the little things. Let me tell you something, church. Don't worry about the burden of outcome. Let God worry about that. He, in fact, he loves to carry the burden of outcome because ultimately he wants to get the glory from it. He doesn't want you to get the glory from it. Oh, I led a tribe to Christ. Look at me. You know what I'm saying? Like, ultimately, God wants to get the glory. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 4 11, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may receive praise. Yeah. Actually, a lot of the reason why we pick up the burden of outcome is because we're using Christianity to prop up our self esteem. You know what I'm saying? We actually read our Bibles not because we want to grow closer to the Lord, but because we want to feel good about ourselves. I helped a granny cross the road. I prayed for a half hour today. I am a super Christian. I'm just awesome, aren't I? And listen, the, the, the goal of Christianity is not to increase your self-esteem. Actually, it's to increase your God esteem, okay? It's to think about you less and to think about God more. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Actually, it's not about you at all. That's why Christ had to come in the first place. You get the idea here, you see? But here's the problem is that we use Christianity as a crutch to prop up our self-esteem. And then when it's not working, when we don't get the leadership opportunities, and when we can't make ourselves feel all this and all that, then all of a sudden we just, then we start getting dejected. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like, uh, it's like NFL quarterbacks. You get all the credit or all the blame and neither is good for you, right? <laughs> Ultimately, in Christianity, you don't want either. You don't want to take credit for the blame or the, or the good stuff. You just want to take steps of obedience, 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 baby steps, and then watch God do what he does and ultimately then you can point to heaven. See, see that, that's how God designed all of this to work. And, but for many of us, we don't even do the little things because we preemptively decided there's no use in even doing that. Why should I even try to get rid of an addiction? I'm always gonna be addicted. Why should I give someone a French Bible? They don't even speak French. You know what I'm saying? We preemptively decide for God what he can and cannot do. 
We carry the burden of outcome and therefore we don't even do the little steps of obedience that God can, that we could totally do. And I, I just, the reason why I'm saying this is because I believe that God is calling all of us to do little things and yet we're, we're getting all up in our head. You're like, should I invite your neighbor? Yes, invite your neighbor. Just pray for the person's healing. Don't worry about the outcome. Just read your Bible for two minutes a day. Remember last week, I'm like, uh, I, I just said, if you wanna get a Bible addiction, all you gotta do is read your Bible for two minutes a day for two months, okay? You gotta establish the habit and then improve on the habit. And, and, and every time I share that, somebody comes up to me, Pastor Peter, come on. How am I supposed to get anything out of a two minutes a day? You even said set your timer, okay? How am I supposed to get anything out of two minutes a day? Don't worry about it. Chill. Some of y'all are so uptight. Man, like just relax. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. You just do the little thing, just two minutes. My goodness, you're overthinking it all because you're carrying the wrong burden. And, and church, here's why this is so important. If you don't understand this, it's gonna kill your walk with God, I'm promising you. It will kill your walk with God. It might, you might be able to prop up your self-esteem for a little bit, but eventually it's gonna become a burden and it's gonna turn into striving and then you're gonna all of a sudden someday say, I don't know if Christianity is really helpful. And you'll become one of those uh, ex-Christians who never actually had Christianity, you had dead religion is what you had. And, and some of you, I actually think that you're experiencing a mediocre version of Christianity carrying the wrong burdens, and I, I just, for example, okay, like let's go back to this whole topic of healing because I really want you to understand this. Now, this last week at our first Wednesday service, I talked about why, I talked about this issue of divine healing. Why doesn't God heal everyone, right? Like I, you hear me share these miracle stories, um, you know, and, and maybe you've even heard of people in our church who've had miracles, but then I think we've also had people that we prayed for that didn't get healed. So what's up with that? Like, how do we, how do we deal with that tension? Well, of course, what I did this last Wednesday is I went through a whole bunch of reasons why people don't always get healed according to the Bible, okay? So the Bible actually says sometimes the delay in our healing happens because of spiritual warfare. There's angels and demons doing battle, and it takes a while. Sometimes there's delays because of that, Daniel 10. Sometimes our faith can actually put a limit on healing. We saw that in Mark 6. We, we we talked about how sometimes God, it isn't even about our faith or even about spiritual warfare. It's that God is actually drawing us to himself. He knows that if he just answered your prayer, you're never going to have intimacy with him, which is ultimately what he wants. It's more important than your healing because it's the thing that causes all healing throughout the whole rest of your life, intimacy. Or sometimes, actually, it has nothing to do with you. God just is timing something in such a cool, glorious way. And at the proper time, all of your friends and family are going to be able to say, dang. That's cool. God showed up in your life. God was timing his glory for a greater good. My point, and even sharing all of that, is that there's a million things can, that can affect the outcome, which is partially why God said, don't worry about it. Forget about it. You know what I mean? Don't, don't handcuff yourself to things that you can't control anyway, that you were never designed to control, because that's really the crux of this issue, is it's a control issue. Now, a lot of people, they wanna control things in their lives for various reasons. We all have different motives. Some of us, it's our, 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 our need, obsessive need for security. Others, it's our, our low self-esteem. We just, uh, let me give you another example. A while back, somebody was experimenting with uh, the, the Bible's commands on tithes and first fruits. And if you don't know what tithes are, basically there's a, there's a ritual where God says, hey, trust me with, give me 10% of your income and I'll take your 90% of your income and stretch it far greater than ever, you would have ever had had you used 100% of your income. So it's all about putting God first in your income and then God blessing your finances. Now, um, so this guy was coming up to me and uh, he was just, he, he felt like the Lord was calling him to do it, but he was scared to do it. And so he was nervous. And he, he asked me this question. He's like, Pastor Peter, what if I obey and the 90% doesn't cover my bills? Like, are you gonna, are you gonna bail me out if I do this? You know, like he, he was all nervous about this and just like, I mean, way overthinking it. And I, he was wrestling with the question ultimately, what if I obey and the outcome doesn't happen? Okay, well, 
in that moment, I was listening to him, and of course, just, you know, he was so emotional about it, and I get it. You know, there's certain things, steps of faith that can be kind of scary. That was scary for me, too, when I first started trying it, but I, I remember in that moment, I finally felt like the Lord wanted me to kind of flip his question around. Instead of saying, what if it doesn't work? I'm like, uh, I flipped it upside down, and I'm like, well, wait, think about this for a second. What if it does work? What if it actually does work? What if God actually fulfilled his promise in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10? Your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. In other words, your bank account is suddenly gonna start flowing in a way you never saw. What if that happens? That's what you need to be thinking about in this season, not what if it doesn't happen. You need to be thinking about what if it does happen. And, and then finally, you know, we talked about it a little while longer and, and, and I finally told him this. Well, here's one thing I know for sure if you and I do nothing, guess what'll happen? Nothing. It's a guarantee, it's a self-fulfilled prophecy. I would rather be wrong trying to obey God than be wrong doing nothing. I would rather pray for 100 people and get one person miraculously healed than pray for nobody and see no miracles. You hear what I'm saying? At the end of the day, the, the Bible says that in this world you're gonna have trials. There's gonna be unanswered prayer and until we get to heaven, that, that's where things are gonna be perfect. That's where everything is gonna happen exactly like we expect. But, but in here we're living in what we call the transition of the ages, the already but not yet. The promises are being, the, the kingdom of heaven is currently breaking out on planet earth and we're just laying hold of it. We're getting the deposit of the age to come by the power of the Holy Spirit is what the Bible teaches. So we're not always gonna get what we want on the timeline that we want. It. God never is done everything I've wanted in the timeline that I wanted, but in the end, it's better, right? So at the, end, at, the, at the end of the day, we obey. We're not worried about the outcome. It's a control issue. Will you surrender control? And I share this because if you're out there today and you're weary, then you've got to understand, you've, you've contracted a counterfeit form of Christianity, and it's sucking the life out of you. Somebody handcuffed you to a burden. Either you did it to yourself, or maybe you, you went to one of those delightful legalistic churches where they use something called guilt and shame to motivate people. Okay, guilt and shame are a great motivator, I'm not gonna lie. People, some of you are like, that's my whole family. This is how we do everything, you know what I'm saying? We just, we give guilt trips to each other, right? Well, okay, guilt may be a motivator, but it's not the motivator that Jesus used. Grace is what teaches us to say no to ungodliness, Titus 2 says, not shame and condemnation. We don't ever have to guilt people with shame. That, that, that's, that's counterfeit Christianity. You, you understand that, right? That, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A lot of people embraced a form of Christianity that just sucked the life out, and, and, and that's the whole point. That's the whole point, you realize that, right? You aren't good enough. You are not qualified to carry the burden of outcome. That is what your sin nature tells you. But, but God's word says you couldn't do it. That's why he had to send his son to die in your place and carry that for you. And, and yet, so many people, they're like, no, 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 no. I need this. I need this. And uh, I don't want to do this and lock myself in accidentally because I don't have the key for real. But I, I just, you know, but you're like, I, I need this. I, I need to lock myself. You, you don't understand. I need to do this. And so what you're doing is you're locking yourself to this giant burden and you're walking around with it, right? I mean, you're sleeping with this giant thing in your bed. You're taking it to restaurants. You're bathing with a giant industrial ladder, this burden of outcome. You're going on dates with it. Dude, you are weird. <laughs> and yet you think it's the very thing that makes you righteous and capable of worshiping today. I'm just telling you, you've, you, you're... you're You've got to set that thing down and unchain yourself, and all of a sudden you'll experience what Jesus talked about. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God's just wanting you to do baby steps that set things into motion. As one last example of this, I, I remember, um, so, okay, so my, the first church that I took over uh, went through a, a pretty significant crisis. I, I took over the church in a crisis, and in the process of doing that, I, I, I realized that the church governance was pretty screwed up, and so uh, one of my goals was to, to really learn about church governance, and after I had planted, I was kind of a little bit of a nerd about it. I know that some of you are like, church governance, what does that even mean? Well, every church has a, has a set of bylaws to it where they kind of dictate how the church makes decisions, and and uh, over the years, I ended up getting called in to help mediate a lot of different church splits. 
And one of the things that I noticed over the years is, is after, after mediating maybe like a half dozen church splits, I started noticing that there's a common denominator between all of these splits. And almost all of these church splits, these disasters where the church is imploded, um, almost all of them had the same bad forms of church governance where they just had too many votes on too highly subjective things and all of a sudden it caused good people to behave badly and then next thing you know, everybody is trying to deliver the church from the other. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I, I, I started coming, I started realizing in those days that, that church governments are kind of like world governments, they all have pros and cons to them, you know what I'm saying? And, and so I started diving into the research and I was shocked that, that almost all growing churches in the United States that are effective in reaching unchurched people have the same form of church governance. I was shocked when I started seeing the data, over 400,000 churches. And then, and then I started seeing all these correlations between there's only one type of church that tends to grow after the founding pastor resigns and it has to be this form of church governance and it was so it was so profound when I saw the data. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, it altered the way that I saw church. In fact, even to this day, I would never go to a church unless I understood it had a certain type of church governance. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be worth the investment in my mind because it's not gonna be around in 15 years. And I, I just, I, finally, I felt like the Lord was like, Peter, you gotta write the book on this. You gotta write a book on this. And, and um, I remember, so I started writing a book on this and I remember as I was writing this thinking, this is the worst nerdy book ever. <laughs> Nobody's gonna read this, like nobody. Like, I mean, talk about a boring subject. Who, who in their life is thinking, you know what I really need to learn about? Church governance theory. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I literally started arguing with the Lord about this. This is a waste of time. You know, even more than that, I, I kept thinking about even publishing it and I'm like, there's no market for this. I mean, first off, 99% uh, of all people, they're not senior pastors or board members. So what good is the book gonna do? They can't even change it. And even the pastors that are, uh, you know, even the people that are senior pastors, that most of them can't change their church governance because they belong to a denomination that dictates, this is how you gotta do it. This is how we've always done it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just, so in my mind, I started arguing with God. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you start informing God of why he hasn't thought things through. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever done that? Like, God, I'm not sure you've been, like, you know, you know God is calling you to do something and yet you're like, God, I don't, I don't think, I think you need like a, you need someone to sit down with you, Lord, and explain to you why this can't work, right? And I, I was explaining to the Lord that no book publisher is ever gonna pick this up because it's too specific. There's no money to make off of it. It's a nerdy academic book, right? Like I, I started thinking, um, you know, it, it's, it's also not even an exciting topic. It's, it's just most people, they just, uh, anyway, I finally felt like, okay, I gotta still do it. So I, I wrote it and, um, and I, I, when I finished, I didn't even know what to do with it, right? Because it's not like, you know, even different publishers were like, yeah, no, we're, we're looking for broad market books that are read by women, you know what I'm saying? Like, which is like 90% of all books, right? But I, I just, I, I, I was like, okay, okay. I wrote a blog on it, put it on my website, saved it as like a digital PDF, right? And of course, sure enough, nothing happened year after year after year. It was just kind of one of those blogs I wrote that had a little extra long blog put in it, right? You know what I'm saying? A whole book worth, right? And, and uh, I, I, all of a sudden, what, what happened was, is I, I was preaching at these different conferences and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I don't even know what happened, but somehow somebody got a hold of this book and started sharing it with people because all of a sudden, out of nowhere, pastors would come up to me and like, oh, you're the pastor who wrote that book. And I'd be like, Pharisectomy, the comedy book? No, you wrote another book? What do you mean? No, the governance book. The, and I'm like, where did you get it? Like, it's not even in stores. You know, like, in my mind, I'd be like scratching my head. And yet everywhere I would go, people would, person after person, like, oh my gosh, that church governance book, it's like altering my church right now. And then I, I literally was speaking at a, at a pastor's conference in Amsterdam, of all places, and a French pastor came up to me and said, oh my gosh, your book is just altering my life. And I'm like, pharisectomy? Broken escalators? No, your governance book. And I'm like, where are people even getting this? Like, it's gotta be like 900 blogs buried in the back. I don't even know what, like, and, and I'm like, no, it's like amazing. Like you, you have to keep promoting that. That's like altering our church. 
And, and I, I remember like kind of scratching my head. I, to this day, I don't even know how it went viral. I finally went on my website and I started realizing how many downloads it had. I was shocked. I was shocked. And I, I just, you know, the whole thing was an experience for me between carrying the burden of obedience and the burden of outcome. I, I basically preemptively told God it's the dumbest idea ever because I was doing God's job. And God was up in heaven saying, Peter, you're not good at that. And I actually, so I, I labored with it. By the way, a quick side note, okay, just let me say this. I, I just, this last year, I ended up rewriting the book with a little more humor and a little more broad market. A happy church governance, it's like happy now. So like maybe four more people will want to buy it. But like, I just thought, you know, no, but seriously, I, I bring that up because uh, one of the things that we're doing this year at Substance is we're finally launching Substance Publishing, which is something that we've been talking about forever. And uh, I really believe that uh, there's gonna be a lot of you who are gonna be authors. God's gonna call uh, not, just, not just artists, but authors. We're gonna have a lot of books come out of this church. And so we, we started a, a, a publishing company. And, and so this is gonna be actually the first one that we're gonna do with it. But I, I, here, here's the reason why I brought that up is because I, I wanted you to understand the difference between obedience and outcome because because ultimately I believe God is calling some of you to do certain things and you're scared to do it. But here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 3, 7, last verse. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Don't overestimate your role in this divine equation, church. Don't overestimate your role, just be faithful. And I, I'm saying that because I believe that there's some of you here today who God is calling you to pray for somebody who's sick and yet you're scared to do it. God is calling you to invite someone to church and you're scared to do it. God is calling you to take a step of obedience. Maybe it's in tithing, maybe it's in sexual purity, maybe it's in fill in the blank and yet you're so worried about the outcome that you're not taking the first step and God is saying to you, would you please let go and let me do what I do. And in that moment, you're all of a sudden gonna apprehend the kingdom, the divine exchange, the real power that God has for you. And listen, once you get that, I'm just telling you, you're not gonna be wearisome. You're, you might be a little intimidated, but you're not gonna be wearisome. Why? Because you know that he who has called you will be faithful to complete it, the Bible says. And so just close your eyes. What is it that God is calling you to do? Where is God calling you to be faithful? Where is he calling you to obey? I want you to take that area of your life and I just want you to surrender it to the Lord. And I believe that God is, is smiling in heaven right now saying, oh, they're finally, you're finally getting it. Get, get rid of your weariness. Just give me, come on the divine adventure where I do miracles in your life that point to me. Would you do it? Where's that area that he's calling you to obey? Father, you see all the lives represented here and all the different things you've called us to accomplish. I pray that we would be a people that doesn't use Christianity to glorify ourselves or that doesn't use Christianity to to for any other purpose but glorify you. I pray that you'd create a story out of all of our lives that is so magnificent that people, when they hear that story, they would not be able to help but to smile when they think of us. And, and God, let it be true about every single person, whatever journey, whatever addiction, whatever task, whatever exploit you're calling us to do, Lord, I pray that we would just do it knowing that you are powerful beyond imagination. You will meet us in this moment. And church, if that's your prayer, then just say this after me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, lead me, starting today, in Jesus' name, amen. With all that said, we're gonna have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're gonna go next. Love you guys. We'll see you next time.